Right, so this is um, a lecture as part of the Lifelong Learning Festival uh, 2018. And tonight's lecture is What is Time? And I'll give you my, the abstract of the talk before we go into the talk itself, just to summarize the type of things we're going to hopefully nail down. So Hamilton had the intuition that the imaginary numbers of mathematics held the key to the science of pure time. And he presented a paper, that's his paper, to the Royal Irish Academy in 1837. They didn't have Netflix in those days, obviously. Now, this long forgotten notion was tentatively resurrected in modern times by Hawking in his little book, A Brief History of Time, which he became famous, famous bestseller. He was trying to resolve some theoretical problems in quantum cosmology. Upon a close re-examination of Einstein's space-time, we are going to show tonight that proper time can indeed be represented on the complex number plane, so that Hamilton's intuition is proved to be correct. This complex time leads to a novel metaphysics of time that is consistent both with science and with our everyday experience of the sharp distinctions between past, present and future. Modern physics allows one to pass from potentiality to actuality only through the action of an observer. And we find that time itself falls under this condition. In a world that demands that cause precede effect, the future is created by present action. But in a world that denies such causality, time becomes a passive stream of one damned tweet after another. We learn that future contingencies can never be foreseen, so we should always be open to the unexpected. And most importantly, we learn that the future is as real as the past, so that utopian pre-constructions of the future are at least as valid as nostalgic reconstructions of the past. So let us look at space and time. <clears throat> Successive historical understandings of space and time were based on scientists' attempts at universality to express the laws of the physics of their day more and more independently of the frames of reference in which the observations and measurements were made. For Aristotle, the hourglass measured time, measured the time dimension, but he had difficulty with the space dimensions since on Earth the vertical direction behaved differently to the horizontal ones. His doctrine of final cause probably arose from the apple finding its own place in nature. It was fulfilling its destiny by falling to the ground. Newton, in turn, separated the apple falling under the influence of gravity from the vertical axis and thereby removed, a, sorry, falling, uh, and thereby removed any distinction between the three 
spatial directions. Galilean relativity provided Newton, sorry, that was Newton and the falling apple, sorry, I'm, let's move on. Galilean relativity provided Newton with inertial frames on which the laws of mechanics were the same for observers that moved at uniform speeds in a straight line relative to each other and for whom the measured speed of an object in space would differ by an amount equal to that relative speed. However, distances between points in space and durations between instants of time would be the same or invariant across all such inertial frames, so that the passenger on the train and the passenger on the platform, sorry, the, this person and this person would measure distances and would measure time the same. They would be invariant, whether you were moving or not, uh, time and distance were invariant. So, following Descartes, the standard reference frame consists of three mutually perpendicular space axes moving along an independent time axis. A hidden assumption implicit to Newtonian mechanics <coughs> is the presence of an observer with instantaneous access to all of space, a circumstance that requires light to have an infinite speed. There is the supplementary assumption that this observer is endowed with a supreme intellect, which, as Laplace famously described, at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed. If this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, it would embrace in a single formula the movement of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. For such an intellect, nothing would be uncertain and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. So, Newtonian mechanics was vulnerable from the start. As Romer's contemporary astronomical observations <coughs> found that light had a hesitation or a finite speed, a fact that Maxwell's electromagnetic theory subsequently supported. Einstein took a step further and declared the speed of light to be invariant across all inertial frames. Fidelity to this declaration led to a new understanding that space and time were enfolded in an entity now referred to as space-time. What has not been noticed before is that implicit in this new space-time is the presence of two observers. The first of which will be described simply as an inhabitant who, due to the finite speed of light, has limited information about his past and limited influence on his future. The second observer will be described as a scientist who, though denied any supreme powers, can at least draw a map of space-time on a page and observe it with a godlike gaze. Circumstances on which the inhabitant and scientist agree are deemed to be absolute. So now, let's get back to some basic stuff. Pythagoras' theorem. Pythagoras and the squared nature of physical measurements. <coughs> so 
this reminds you of your school days, I know. <coughs> the difference x2 minus x1 between the, co the coordinates of any two points on the x-axis could yield a positive or a negative real number depending on the order in which the points are taken. However, the square of the difference x2 minus x1 squared is always a positive number. The scalar distance between two points, which must necessarily be positive, is defined to be the positive square root of this squared term. In three-dimensional space, Pythagoras' theorem provides the positive squared terms automatically, as the square of the distance between two points is the sum of the squares of the differences between their, co their respective coordinates. So we have the, oops, the square of the distance between two points, the sum of the squares of the different coordinates. And that's always a positive number. And we take the positive square root of that to get the actual distance at the end of the day. And sim the sim similar th things, thing, the similar thing happens in time. Duration of time is similarly expressed as the positive square root of t2 minus t1 all squared. So reference frames in which Pythagoras' theorem applies are known as Euclidean spaces because we're following Euclid's old theorems to get to Pythagoras' theorem in the first place. So that's a Euclidean space. Pythagoras' theorem applies in Euclidean space. So the square root of any positive number can be either positive or negative. So one of the consequences of the squared nature of these physical measurements is that the laws of physics derived from them do not distinguish between positive and negative directions in space or time. While this lack of distinction in spatial direction is acceptable to our everyday sensibilities, in that we can have equal access to over here as over there. When it comes to direction in time, however, to say that before is equivalent to after simply does not tally with our experience of time in that cause must necessarily precede effect if our physical reality is to have any consistency. Causality is the term that embodies this necessary time sequence which is not inherent in the equations of mechanics. Consistency is only achieved by importing the arrow of time from elsewhere, such as the thermodynamic argument that entropy tends to increase with time. So now let's go to four dimensions, the space-time interval. So an event in four-dimensional space, in, sorry, in four-dimensional space-time is represented as a point x, y, z, t in which all four coordinates are calibrated in the same units. If the time coordinate is in seconds, then the three space coordinates are in light seconds, the distance light travels in one second, which is about the distance to the moon. Light takes about a second to get to the moon. The interval, or space-time distance, between any two such events is the new invariant 
that must incorporate in turn the invariant speed of light. Applying Pythagoras' theorem blindly to our two points, x1 and x2, Pythagoras is here to interval. We're going to use the symbol S for interval. So the interval squared is this, the square of the differences between the different coordinates. And that's a blind application of Pythagoras' theorem. Just here, throw it into the, to the algorithm. And here's, the, here's what we get out. Applying Pythagoras' theorem blindly to four-dimensional space-time yields an expression for the squared interval as s squared equals that thing there with the red uh, plus signs. Now, if we look at that carefully, we'll see that t1 minus t2 minus t1 squared would be the same as t1 minus t2 squared. We'd get the same magnitude. If we altered the direction of time, t2 minus t1 squared, t1 minus t2 squared, they're the same. So this expression cannot tell the difference in time sequence. Either will do. Either will come up with the same term. So in, this ex in the Pythagoras expression, the time sequence or reversal of time sequence could go unnoticed. So this formula does not respect causality. Causality is violated. So we are led to the conclusion that causality is not respected in a Euclidean space-time. Space-time cannot be Euclidean if it's going to respect causality. However, it transpires that in order to obtain an invariant measure of interval that respects causality and the invariant speed of light, the form of the Pythagorean expression is still OK. But the sign of the space term must be the opposite that of the time term. So s squared is equal to minus, 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 plus. If I do that simple sign change, I get an expression that will respect causality and respect time sequence. And this gives space time, and we'll see it in a minute, that's what, what we call, we call it a hyperbolic geometry, not a Euclidean geometry. Okay, but that's only a term for the moment. So it's a different type of geometry. And we're going to find that it is this difference in sign between the space and time terms that is the secret between the difference of space and time in nature. Now, before we go on, I've got to introduce a, a textbook trick, reducing all of our dimensions so that we, we don't have all these subscripts to worry about, uh, one, two, three, and four. We're going to reduce our dimensions to two. So the textbook approach <coughs> captures the salient features yet simplifies the algebra, is to deal with a space-time of two dimensions, in which space consists only of the straight line x-axis. That's all space is. And this straight line persists in time. <coughs> time is depicted as a, a transverse straight line t-axis. So we have our x-axis persisting in time. Shh. So it's, it, 
draws out a two-dimensional space. Events can only occur on the x-axis, but occurring at different times, each event can be unambiguously located at the coordinates x, t in this two-dimensional plane. The expression for the squared interval between the first event located at the origin, 0, 0, and the second event located at the point x, t, with the time term taking the positive sign and the space term therefore taking the negative sign, simplifies to s squared equals minus x squared plus t squared. So we have a very simple expression for our, our space-time interval. It looks very like the parabolic equations we learned in school, for, except this is the first cousin to the parabolic equation. But you can see s squared is minus x squared <coughs> plus t squared. That's our basic equation. And we're going to get a lot of mileage out of that. Let's go to the next slide. So there it is written out in big letters. S squared is minus x squared plus t squared. Now, in this equation, both x and t are real numbers. So regardless of whether they are individually positive or negative, both x squared and t squared are always positive. The difference in sign between x squared and t squared can, depending on their relative sizes, lead to values of s squared that are positive, zero or negative. It is clear that when s squared is positive, if this is a positive thing, then this term must dominate. The time term dominates if, that's a, if s squared is a positive number. And intervals for which s squared is positive are referred to as time-like intervals. Um, conversely, if s squared is negative, that means that this is the dominant term, and those intervals are referred to as space-like intervals. Now, <coughs> two-dimensional space-time is usually depicted with time on the vertical axis and space on the horizontal axis. So it is expedient to express the equation for the squared interval in the more familiar functional form. This is the vertical axis, this is the horizontal axis, and this is another variable. OK, we're just going to express it as in, in that kind of functional form, t playing the role of the dependent variable and x playing the role of the independent variable. That's just the way we, we normally depict functions. The next slide shows us a, a graph of this equation for the particular case of s equals 1, t is positive, and x can go from minus x to plus x. And we see that that equation is this curve here. And that curve is a hyperbola. That's why we say, that's what the reason the, the space is called hyperbolic space-time, that these curves plot out hyperbolas in our map of space-time. <coughs> and you can see that hyperbola is a first cousin to the parabola that we learned in school when we're looking for roots of quadratic equations. This is its first cousin. It's not a parabola because we have, there's a square on that side 
if that was just t equals x squared plus x squared, that would be a parabola. But we have t squared equals x squared plus x. So it's a hyperbola, a first cousin to the parabola. But you can see this curve is like a, a parabola. It's got a dip, and it goes off to infinity at each end, and it doesn't cross the x-axis in this particular case. So it's very like the parabola we learned in school. Now, let's go back to our equation. <coughs> let's look at the case where s is equal to 0. When s equals 0, t squared equals x squared. Or t, therefore, is equal to plus or minus x. Because we can never forget that when we take the square root of a square, it could be positive or negative. So if t is equal to plus or minus x, this means that the time in seconds is exactly equal to the distance in light seconds travelled in that time. So this condition can only be met by a light beam travelling along the x-axis. So the relationship t equals plus or minus x corresponds to these dotted lines here. They're lines at 45 degrees to the t and x-axis. If t is equal to x, there has to be along that 45 degree line. And these lines, these dotted lines, define the boundaries between our, what we call, time-like intervals and space-like intervals, when s squared is positive or s squared is negative. And the region in between these two curves is, no, we call that to be inside the light cone, because in three dimensions, or in, if we added another dimension, this, this, this shape would form a cone. And we say that this curve is inside the light cone, and out here, we're outside the light cone. Is that OK? And these, these cones, these, the, the dotted lines, define the boundaries between positive and negative s squared. So. <coughs> Let's look at a fuller picture of space-time, where we go to the negative t direction. This is just this, this, these curves plotted for different values of s, s positive, s, neg s negative, s, well, we talked about s squared being positive, or s squared being negative. So if I go back to s, if s squared is positive, s can be minus or positive, can be plus or minus. But if I have s squared negative, s has to be imaginary. OK? So in, in the regions of negative s squared, which is over in these regions, S is imaginary in these regions, and these regions, S is positive up here, negative down here. But if I square it, it all becomes positive. Is that OK? So these regions up here is known as the absolute future. So in other words, my inhabitant and my, uh, my scientist will absolutely agree on time sequence in these regions, this region, and this region. This is the absolute past of the origin. We're talking about the future of this origin point here, the absolute past of the origin. And over here, we've got this strange place called the absolute elsewhere. So let's go and discuss those. So <coughs> S squared is positive in the time-like intervals, measured from the origin to events lying in those areas bounded by the light cones and enclosing the t-axis that lie either in the upper half of the diagram, as I've indicated, the absolute future, or in the lower half of the diagram, or in the absolute past of the origin. These time-like regions are considered to be inside the light cone, 
and the full, full map as drawn by the scientist. And this map encompasses all the sign options for S, X, and T. And the contours in space-time, these are all contours of that same curve, where I don't have it up, of T squared equals uh, X squared plus S squared. For each constant positive value of S squared occur in paired hyperbolic, hyperbolic branches. So here's for S equals 1, here's for S equals minus 1. Here's for s equals i, 1 times i. Here is s for minus 1 times i. <coughs> Paired hyperbolic branches. One branch located in the absolute future and the other in the absolute past. And they're depicted on the slide. So each contour is the locus of events that are perceived to be simultaneous to a stationary inhabitant. And as no, no contour in the absolute future and the absolute past crosses the x-axis, he can never mistake events occurring after his origin for those occurring before it. So causality is respected in time-like regions. And this is where the inhabitant and scientist absolutely agree on time sequence. S squared is negative for space-like intervals measured from the origin to events lying outside the light cones in the two remaining regions referred to as the absolute elsewhere. <coughs> Notice of the occurrence of these events can never reach the origin as the signal would have to travel faster than the speed of light. The relevant contours in space-time are again paired hyperbolic branches, but oriented in this case along the x-axis. So now we have the same type of hyperbolas, but they're, lo they're located out along this axis, the x, the plus x, and the minus x axis. These contours have real zero crossings on the x-axis. They cross the x-axis. So inhabitants on different inertial frames may see the second event as occurring before or after the event at the origin, in possible contradiction to the time sequence witnessed by the scientist who has the whole map of space-time at his disposal. Indeed, a stationary inhabitant located at a fixed value of x, so if I have a stationary inhabitant sitting out here, not moving, he's just existing in time, he'll, prop, he'll go up along a vertical line. He has no access to the original event, and he can ascribe any convenient time sequence as long as he is consistent. However, this is our stationary inhabitant out in the absolute elsewhere. This is the origin. We find that if he sits still and waits, he's going to come in for a rude awakening, where causality, he, he's going to bump into causality at some time in the future. Reality is going to hit him in the head and bring him face to face with causal reality. Sorry, so this, this is a, I, I've taken this picture from um, the Hawking's book. This is allegedly, this is the sun, and we're going to pretend the, sun uh, the light has switched off in the sun at this moment. And we're here on Earth, and we don't know when the light goes off, it takes time for that signal to reach us. So we've got to, we will proceed oblivious until eight minutes, eight minutes or so, and then it hits us. Oh, the lights have gone out. The electricity is off. No Netflix tonight. So this is, anyone in, in the absolute elsewhere will eventually, if they don't do anything, will, are in for a rude awakening at some point. So now, let's look at what all this means to us. Let's look at proper time. So 
in the time-like regions, the hyperbolic contours never cross the x-axis. So they must have two imaginary roots. And indeed, the equation t squared equals x squared plus x, x, x squared plus s squared has two imaginary roots x plus i s, where i is the, is the square root of minus 1, x minus i s. We have two imaginary roots. And we're going to look at what we call proper time. So this is for a stationary inhabitant who is going to sit on the time axis at x equals 0. He is traveling, he's just sitting there, and so the time is moving along. So this is x equals 0. And if x is equal to 0 here, we find that t squared is i s minus i s. All right? And we have no x's in this equation. So the units of time here and here have to be seconds. They're pure seconds. None of this light second business. They're pure seconds. So the units here are seconds, seconds. So we're going to, in th for this particular instant, what we call proper time, we're going to relabel s equals tau, suggestive, because tau is very like t. And we find that proper time is rendered as t squared equals plus i tau minus i tau. That's momentous. That's the momentous announcement of this talk, believe it or not. So we have squared proper time duration is the product of the imaginary past and imaginary past and imaginary future. <coughs> so uh, proper time can be depicted on a complex number plane with t along the real axis and tau along the imaginary axis. So we're going to depict proper time in this. And this is, again, a slide I think I've stolen off Stephen Hawking. He didn't have the last previous equation in mind, but he had this slide. Time, real time along one axis, and this ima funny imaginary time, whatever it is, along the vertical axis. So let's look at what that means for the present. And let me get a slug of water before we... We're going to let T refer to the present. So we're, the present is somewhere past an origin, or somewhere before an origin, who, who knows? But t will be some distance from an origin. So if t refers to the present, <coughs> which is an, ev an event located before or after the chosen origin, then t squared, which is the squared proper time duration, can be mathematically factored in three different ways. t squared is equal to plus t times plus t. Yeah, that's t squared. Nobody can argue with that. t squared can be minus t times minus t. Nobody can argue with that. Minus by minus is plus. We learned that, that in school. And then we have a third one that we've just discovered that t squared can also be represented as plus i tau minus i tau equals tau squared. t squared equals tau squared, but t is not equal to tau. t is plus i tau minus i tau. Okay? So the factors in the first two cases are real and represent time duration measured along the future and the past, respectively. 
and because of the ambiguity of the sign of the square root, the inhabitant and scientist may not agree on which is past or future. So these two cases represent meaningless, a-causal time, similar to that encountered in the absolute elsewhere. In contrast, what is offered in the third case is the squared time duration expressed in terms of the product of its two conjugate imaginary roots, in which the past and future are equally represented in the present. Arising in time-like regions where the inhabitant and scientist agree on time sequence and causality is therefore respected, this third case conforms to the inhabitant's experience of time and provides, in my view, the necessary mathematical abstraction to help distinguish between real measured time and the everyday psychological experience of time and the present. On the complex number plane depicting proper time, if measured time is on the real axis and imaginary time is on the imaginary axis, then experienced time resides along a line parallel with the imaginary axis. It's on this mysterious glowing green line. This is the, this is the time that we experience. The only real time of the inhabitant's experience, the present, occurs at the point where the imaginary line crosses the real axis. This point here, where this line crosses the real axis, is the real point. It, so experienced time is a mix of the inhabitant's memories of the past and his dreams of the future both of which collapse into real time only when it is measured and registered. Oops, I gotta go. It's only when we register time that it becomes real. And we all experience, we, this is our daily experience. Every time we look at the clock, we're looking, we're looking at the clock not to see the time, but to see what is the interval to my next, what's my next appointment. We only register time when we look at the clock. But at other times, we're just drifting along. Real time is only when it's registered, as, as kind of quantum physics teaches us the same thing. So time duration can be measured with a clock, for sure. And distance can be measured with a meter stick. However, as time duration in causal reality invokes the past and the future symmetrically through its conjugate imaginary roots, are we obliged to assert that we have equal access to before and after in time? Just as we have access to here and there in space, without recourse to science fiction. In the present, we can easily insist that neither the past nor the future exist. Yet, we are comfortable with the scientific fact that a photograph of the night sky can indeed give us access to the past in that we can at least reconstruct the past state of the universe through traces of the past left in the present. An archaeological dig can reveal the past state of human culture through traces left in the debris and geology provides access to the past state of organic and inorganic nature through traces left in the rocks, etc. 
We can agree that the past is real, even though we may reconstruct it differently, depending on our level of knowledge and, of course, level of bias at any one time. But what about the future? Can we claim, as we now must, from the symmetry of past and future in the conjugate imaginary roots of the squared time duration, that the future is at least as real as the past? Can we find in the present the precursors to the future that enable us to pre-construct the future, just as traces from the past allow us to reconstruct the past. The ancient hourglass has an uncanny resemblance to the light cones of space-time, and the flow of sand through its tiny aperture provides a stark image of how the past is spent and how the future is very real indeed, as everything we are consuming and burning up is contained in it. Leibniz's old adage that the present is always pregnant with the future must be overturned. It is the future that is always pregnant with the present. The Native American saying that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children, enjoins us to imagine that it is future generations who, having neither physical nor legal existence, bring us everything we have, all of our dreams, hopes, and values. Open to the unexpected, the logic of action. We are certainly able to project a probable future on the basis of our knowledge of events and facts from the past and of the general regularities, trends and laws that we have abstracted, either consciously or intuitively, from past experience. For instance, we can confidently predict that the sun will rise in the morning. But this future does not exist, for it is nothing more than an image or an expectation. If our projections are well-founded, then the actual future when it comes, may be close to what was expected. However, our projections are subject to contingent factors that exist in domains that are inaccessible at any given moment, so that sometimes the future is different from our expectations. Indeed, our relativity theory only confirms this experience, as events from the absolute elsewhere can impinge unexpectedly on our future. When the origin, if we consider our present to be the origin, then it is commonplace that the present is where the past and future meet. However, it is the only place where the past and future meet the absolute elsewhere. So it is here that we must be ever open to an encounter with the unexpected. This indeterminacy of the present sheds some light on the logic of action. If, when compelled to act, we wait until we have all the necessary information at our disposal, then we, be we become locked in a state of paralysis, of persistent deferral, for there are always unknowns that prohibit complete knowledge. A true act or true decision takes place without complete knowledge, and as such, it can only be axiomatic, grounded in itself. The true act creates new possibilities, so it represents a radical discontinuity with the present. 
in contrast, the pure act, understood to be the actualization of existing possibilities, is grounded in full factual knowledge. Realizing old possibilities, it is in full continuity with the present. It is here that we can locate the difference between the inhabitant whose pure act is based on factual or sensible knowledge, and the scientist, whose true act requires an intelligible or axiomatic decision of thought. In Newtonian mechanics, momentum is the capacity for action in space, and energy is the capacity for action in time. And let's go back to old Hamilton, Hamil Hamilton again, Hamilton's action. Hamilton's action for a particle's trajectory is defined to be the summation over its entire time of flight of the difference between its actualized kinetic energy and its remaining potential energy evaluated at each point. Let the action between two points a and B on that trajectory be represented by the square brackets. So we're saying the action from A to B, square brackets AB. And let, let the action of the reverse trajectory between the same two points be BA, square brackets. So if the reverse trajectory is free from contingencies, then both actions will be equal and AB minus BA equals zero. However, once contingencies are allowed for, our best assertion can only be that AB minus BA equals epsilon, where epsilon represents the indeterminacy arising from the parallax between the two measurements. So just as the parallax associated with our binocular vision provides a true perspective, once both views are treated with equal prominence, in a certain sense, epsilon represents the grain of truth, the gap between the pure act and the true act. This gap arises naturally for the inhabitants of Einstein's space-time, for whom the past of the second measurement is different from that of the first. The same gap arises in quantum physics with Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle, which states that the smallest gap between two consecutive measurements is not zero, but is an indivisible knot of either momentum and spatial position, or of energy and time, called the quantum of action. So, sorry, next slide. BA minus AB is the quantum of action. So it's the same argument in quantum physics as in relativity there. And we have the knot of position, momentum, or energy and time equals the action. So now let me conclude and we can conclusion. So some of the unexpected results from this study have been that both causality and the physical reality of time require the intervention of the inhabitant. In the first case, he must choose the origin, and in the second, he must register the real-time duration from that origin. Unfolded in the domain of science, this new understanding of time finally catches up with that of the philosopher-mathematician Alain Badiou, for whom time is intervention itself thought as the gap between two events. However, these results should not really be surprising, as a glance at today's date shows that humanity has ever defined its current epoch through affirming its original event. 
Before Einstein, scientists had only passively interpreted the world in various ways. After Einstein, the agency of the two inhabitant types is included as part of the world, where, through changing its obstinate, stubborn and intractable matter, their role is to discover its factual verities and rational truths. Inhabitants are not obliged to cede their agency to the corporation, the nation or the market, each of which cloak the reality of the future with their injunctions to spend and consume as if there was no tomorrow. For in this new understanding of time, the future is as real as the past. That there is a build-up to World War III by the great powers is already yesterday's news. But let there be no doubt, this war has already begun and it is our children and our youth who are bearing the brunt. Our children and our future are being sacrificed on the altar of the market with its emblem the golden calf. The devastation is worldwide from Syria, the Congo, Burma, Palestine to the school shootings in the United States to the youth suicide epidemic in our own country, to crippling student debt across the Western world, and to the global consequences of the continuing austerity imposed to save the banks. Our young people have shown that they are not prepared to sacrifice themselves without a fight, calling it as they see it, B.S. The duty of us older generation is to align with the youth and supplement their factual truth by only accepting rational arguments that link cause with effect and by rejecting all arguments that fail to do so. We must hear these voices from the future and together with them call out the linguist trickery of the spin doctors to declare that not only is it BS, it is absolute BS. And we must start today. It is not that tomorrow may be too late, but that tomorrow may never come. Thank you very much.